Matthew chapter 2. Second. Just got to share my screen here. All right, we're good, Jen? Yeah. All right. All right. I had to catch my breath. That was a little bit of running for me. <laughs> Matthew chapter two. Uh, we're so grateful for Paul introducing us to our three-part Christmas series. Um, as was mentioned, we looked at gold, but we also had a little recap of the Christmas story or this portion of the Christmas story of the wise men bringing their gifts. And so in Matthew chapter two, we'll just read a few verses just to kind of remind us where we're at. Matthew chapter two, starting at verse nine. When they heard the king, they departed, and this is the wise men here in King Herod. They departed and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we trust that the Lord will bless the reading of his word. Good? All right. All right. Thanks, Jim, for your help. All right. So, continuing in this story of the wise men and historical narrative of the wise men bringing these valuable treasures to give to the newborn king, the newborn savior. And again, many people will discuss it was maybe however much later, right? Maybe not newborn, but maybe Jesus was born a number of months, a number of years even before the wise men arrived. But we realize that the wise men were filled with exceedingly great joy. This morning we look at frankincense and I've entitled this message, A Sweet Smelling Aroma, as we consider frankincense. And I wanna ask the question to each and every one of us, when you think of Christmas, what do you think of? I think there's many things we can think of. And actually this morning, uh, my brother Jim in our, uh, our remembrance meeting talked about how senses, our senses, bring about remembrance. And so thinking of the senses, I think there's no other holiday that we celebrate in our nation where we think of our senses as much than compared with Christmas, right? Christmas, think about the sights of Christmas, right? The Christmas tree in the house. We have visual things up here reminding us of Christmas. The lights on the houses in your neighborhood. What about the sounds of Christmas, right? We think of the songs we sung this morning. I encourage everyone to come out tonight. The kids will be singing Joy to the World, Away in a Manger, Silent Night. Even without hearing the words, the words, the melodies of these songs make us think of Christmas. And trust me, you don't want to miss tonight's performance. I'm really looking forward to it. And on that note, I will pause to say a huge thank you to Craig and all the rest that are putting all the effort into this Christmas program. Um, it, it truly is a blessing to have uh, to have that team working on it. So uh, really looking forward to the Christmas carousel tonight. Uh, but the sights, the sounds, I think there's no other season where we think about the sense of smell when it comes to Christmas, right? Thinking of the smells associated with Christmas. And I want to give the title to this message, um, the, the power of perfume, the, the force of a fragrance, the ability of an aroma to transport us to another place, to bring us back in time, right? There are certain smells that once you smell it, you're moved to a completely different place 20, 30 years ago. I know I always think of, and not even so much as the taste, but more so the smell of my mom making those Christmas sugar cookies. And whenever I smell that, I'm five years old again. I'm excited to wake up in the morning and run down and look under the Christmas tree and see what I got for Christmas, right? Smells have the ability to bring about remembrance. Smells are extremely powerful. I'll share a story that I'm sure most of you uh, are aware of. When I was a, a young nursing student, my first clinical rotation, so I was either 19, maybe 20, uh, first clinical rotation was labor and delivery. And I had to go in and I had to observe a C-section. 
Now, visual things don't disturb me as much as smells do. So I'm gowned up, I got my mask on, and with the C-section, not to get too graphic, they're making the incision, it, it, it's, it, they're cauterizing, right? They're burning as they're cutting the flesh to minimize the bleeding. And that wonderful, sweet-smelling aroma of burning flesh. And within a second, I was down. Nursing student in the corner passes out the strong, powerful impact of a smell, right? A smell could make me lose consciousness. What did they what did they do to bring me back to life, so to say? Well, they got those smelling salts and that ammonia they put up, and the smell rose me to life again, right? We see that the power of smell, right? And smell is such a powerful thing that God chose to use it, even in the Old Testament. We see this, this phrase, a sweet smelling aroma, specifically in reference to frankincense um, and other things as well, but how it is oftentimes coupled with a sweet aroma to the Lord and a memorial to the Lord. That when the Israelites, when they gathered at this tabernacle and the offerings were made and the incense was burned, this sweet aroma brought about memories, remembrances of the Lord's faithfulness, delivering them from Egypt providing for them in the desert years, right? But a sweet smelling aroma to bring about memories of the Lord's faithfulness. Just a little overview uh, as far as what we're gonna look at this morning. We're gonna talk about what is frankincense? What was, and sorry, I just gotta move my little uh, window here. There we go. What is frankincense? What was it used for? What does it signify? And what does it matter, right? I think ultimately, after we look at the word of God, we want to ask ourselves, what does it matter? Why should I care about this ancient gift that a wise man brought to Jesus when he was born? What does that have to do with me today and my remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is? And I have our verse up there, Matthew 2, 11, one more time. What was the wise men's response when it says they saw the young child with Mary, his mother? Their response was they fell down and worshiped him. Is that our response when we look at the word of God and we see the Lord Jesus Christ in his beauty, in the wonder that the son of God would humble himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. And yes, a lowly birth in a manger, but to become a curse for us. When I see the savior in the pages of scripture, do I fall down and worship? And we see their response continued. They opened their treasures, not just any gift, but costly, valuable treasures gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And this morning, we'll be looking at frankincense. So we had a little bit of this in our review uh, when we talked about what is frankincense. So I didn't mention the name, but it comes from the Boswellia tree. And we do see that in scripture in the Song of Solomon. And it is specifically the tree resin that is produced from the tree. And the best way, I, I know, um, what's the word, arborist, or uh, I don't study trees or understand them too well, but think of maple syrup, right? It's almost like this sap that comes out of the tree, but the tree resin, we see the places where it's mentioned, where you would find it. Um, but what is the process? And I was just, my mind immediately went to my savior, right? As, as I saw videos and read resources of the process of obtaining frankincense, it's described as you need to wound the tree, right? You chip away a piece of the bark. It's called wounding the tree. And that resin bleeds out. It's bled out. It's hardened. And then it's removed. It's harvested from the tree. How could I not think of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was wounded for our transgressions? The one who, as we're reminded, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Again, what great reminders, even just in the process of how frankincense is obtained and, and the purpose. It's used for incense and perfume. We see both of those occurrences in scripture. Now, I will mention, I have a few samples um, from, uh, from many here in this room. Thank you so much for your generosity just to share these. And I'll have these at the back if you want to take a look at it. But here's actual, this is frankincense and myrrh, um, but the little chunks of tree resin. So I'll have that at the back on your way out if you want to take a look at that. I also have um, actual incense, which, I mean, we're familiar with these, right? And so actually, I was homesick with a, a kid. One of our kids was sick last week. So as I'm listening to Paul's message on gold, I said, let me just light this and get this, get, get in, the, in the zone. Let me get in the mood of, uh, of preparing for my message, as we learned of gold last week. But you burn the incense, and it has a very earthy, woodsy tree-ish smell um then also i was given 
this uh, this essential oil with frankincense, right? And so the incense mixed with oils. And so we see it was also used as medicine, right? Not necessarily referenced in scripture, but we have well-documented in history on ancient cultures where frankincense, and even today, is used for healing. Now, I read uh, particularly with respiratory ailments, frankincense uh, can, can be very beneficial. And I truly believe in the benefit of essential oils. Now, I don't believe in how much people charge for it, uh, but I do believe in the effectiveness of it. Um, I did, uh, as I was smelling it, it's very, very earthy. I would put a little on my wrist and it's kind of my cologne for the day. So if you walk close to me, maybe I smelled a little bit like frankincense. I don't know if you can overdose on frankincense. So hopefully I didn't do too much of it, but it's very powerful, very powerful in the sense of incense, perfume and medicine. Um, I do also have, and I will bring this back with me, at the very end, I, uh, I ordered on Amazon a box of frankincense sticks. So a parting gift for each and every one of you. If you didn't earn the prize from the review game, I do have a stick of frankincense that you can bring home and, and light it at home. Don't light it back here, uh, but light it at home. And just that, again, I, I feel almost like the smell of a Christmas tree. It's a little bit different, but that earthy smell. Um, so. I did ask Paul why he wasn't willing to bring a sample of gold to give out to everyone last week, but um, this was a little more affordable. So, um, but as we look at scripture, what is frankincense? Okay, we've had a little bit of review of that, but what was it used for? Well, frankincense is referenced in scripture 17 different times and for a variety of reasons. So I mentioned earlier in the quiz, it was used in the tabernacle and the services of the high priest. And so a few of those references, let's actually turn to Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30, and we'll read this. This is the first occurrence of frankincense in scripture. Exodus chapter 30, and this is a description of the composition of the incense that was made to be burned on the altar of incense within the tabernacle. And what was the tabernacle? The tabernacle was God's meeting place where he came to dwell and, and be among his people. So the incense was made up of in Exodus 30, verse 34. The Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, stacti and anica and galbanum and pure frankincense with these sweet spices. There shall be equal amounts of each. You shall make of these an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting, where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. But as for the incense which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourselves. According to its composition, it shall be to you holy for the Lord. Whoever makes any like it, to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. Right? We're reminded of this sweet smelling combination of uh, different natural materials. And we realized that it was sacred, right? Holy unto the Lord, not to be used as a common thing. And while it is very valuable, as we see even through other pages of scripture, we see that it was used in this incense, decided by God to be used in the worship coming to him. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move on through this morning. It was used also in the tabernacle with a number of the offerings, the grain offering, the burnt offerings, not all the offerings, but some of them. And we see that as this sweet smelling aroma ascended up to God, we're reminded of that phrase. It was a memorial to the Lord. This smell to bring about remembrances, just as we talked about even today, smells are very powerful and they can bring about certain remembrances. The table of showbread as well. We realize the bread was on that table, but also frankincense was put on top of that. All part of this approach to God as the people desired to approach God, frankincense played a major role. And as we heard that phrase in the verses we read, it was holy to the Lord, not to be used as a common thing, people's own personal use, but specifically to be used, sacred, set apart for approaching the Lord. And then we see this phrase in a number of the references that I have up there, this phrase of pure incense or pure frankincense. Now, it's interesting to note that frankincense, that English word comes from, I believe there's French roots, the frank part of frankincense also means pure. So it's almost like saying when we see in scripture, pure frankincense, it's like doubly pure, pure, pure incense, right? And we see that this was specifically set aside for approaching 
the Lord, a holy God. We also see in scripture it was used as perfume. We see that in Song of Solomon. And it was used as commerce. I will just mention Revelation uh, chapter 18, used in commerce in the sense that it was very valuable. We talked about the fact that these wise men brought treasures. It was extremely valuable. And in Revelation 18, we see a list of a number of valuable natural materials, frankincense included among them, and they're described as this, precious. These are all the materials co collectively combined. They're described as precious, fine, fragrant, most precious, rich and splendid. And when I think about what the wise men brought, their valuable treasure, does that describe what I bring to the Lord? Is, and I oftentimes think of the three T's, right? Our time, our talent, and our treasure. These things are valuable, right? But does that describe my offering to the Lord? Am I giving to the Lord from my own life that which is precious, fine, fragrant, most precious, rich and splendid? I pray that that would be the case for each and every one of us. What was frankincense used for? We see a few examples here. And then our next question, what does it signify? Now, different commentaries and different authors will suggest the gift of frankincense from the wise men signify this, signify that. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the potential things that it represented. But we did look at gold, right? We reminded last week, as far as one thing that gold may have represented in giving it to Jesus, the newborn Savior, but Christ is King. Paul referenced Revelation 14, 14, the Son of Man coming with a golden crown. Right? We're reminded in Revelation, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the gift of gold, speaking of Christ as King. But what about frankincense? Well, I invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And, and I just love the picture here. And, and I think of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Alpha and the Omega, the complete picture and the complete word of God revealing himself to man. And even in that, we look in the Gospels and we see that Jesus is declared as the Lamb of God, but he's also the shepherd, right? Both the lamb and the shepherd. But we also see in Hebrews 7, 27, that Jesus is the high priest, but he's also the sacrifice. He's the whole package. And we praise God for this. And even this picture of frankincense, as it was used in the offerings, as it was used in the incense within the tabernacle of man approaching God, we see this gift of frankincense reminding us of Christ as high priest. And even with that, Christ is sacrificed. Let's read together Hebrews chapter 7, starting at verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins, right? because we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He had no sins first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, did once for all when he, as our high priest, offered up himself. He is the high priest, but he's offering himself. He's offering himself as a sacrifice so that we then, through the Lord Jesus Christ, can approach God. What great pictures we have of this furniture and the services within the tabernacle as we look upon how frankincense was, an, was included in that. And we see this gift of frankincense speaking of Christ as high priest and sacrifice. But frankincense also elsewhere in scripture represents our prayers. And I say that maybe in a more broader term, incense in general, right? So Psalm 141 and verse two, you can turn there if you'd like, but I'm gonna read that for us. Um, and this is actually the only reference to incense that we have in the book of Psalms. So Psalm 141 and verse two, let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up my hand of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And not just here, but elsewhere, we see that incense is a representation of our prayers as that incense was lit and the smoke ascended up. It's this imagery, this picture, this type of our prayers ascending up to God. And I hope you firmly believe that, that God hears our prayers if we come to him through Jesus Christ and we can praise God for that. As a memorial as well, we mentioned earlier, right? Frankincense is this sweet smelling aroma. And that phrase, Leviticus 6.15, as well, as well as elsewhere in the Old Testament in describing the tabernacle, this sweet aroma to the Lord as a memorial to the Lord. And how this smell brought about remembrance of the Lord's faithfulness, his deliverance, his provision for the nation of Israel. 
I wanted to read these lines here of one of my favorite hymns that we often sing in our, our Lord's Supper, our Remembrance Meeting. And just to think of these words entitled The Holiest We Enter and thinking of the holy place and the most holy place, these rooms within the tabernacle. Much incense is ascending before the eternal throne. God graciously is bending to hear each feeble groan. To all our prayers and praises, Christ adds his sweet perfume. And love the censer raises these odors to consume. O God, we come with singing because the great high priest our names to thee is bringing, nor ever forgets the least. As, as I was thinking about those words, I was reminded of the Spirit of God has chosen in Scripture to give us chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter. I, I wish I counted all of them. So many chapters within the Word of God that describe the tabernacle, right? And this is not to, to challenge the amount of time we spend on Christmas ministry. This is a three-part series, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. But really two chapters on the Christmas story, but way more than that on the tabernacle, the high priest, what they were to wear, the sacrifices that they were to offer, the incense. And I, it was a challenge to me, and I challenge and encourage each and every one of you. I said, how often do I study the tabernacle? And it was, oh, that's just the Old Testament. I don't need to. No, there's so many beautiful pictures. And we see in Hebrews, and we even see references in Revelation that remind us that the tabernacle speaks of heavenly things speak of things to come, things that we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ can look forward to. And I hope as I get to some of these references that, that you would be just as thrilled as I was as I read these and I said, how is this not a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ? And I was just thrilled to see some of these references. We'll get there, so ha hang on tight. I I'm, I'm excited to share these verses with you. But I will mention our brother Phil Parsons will uh, be sharing from the word next week. And so I will say, come back next week for myrrh. All right, so <laughs> frankincense, a sweet smelling aroma, right? We looked at what it is, what is it used for? What does it signify now? What does it matter? Why should I care? Do we need to come? Should I leave this at the back? And every time that we come to remember the Lord Jesus Christ every Sunday morning and study his word and lift up our prayers, do we each need to light a stick of frankincense and hold it within us or hold it in front of us so that our prayers will be accepted by God so that he will accept us? I think it's pretty clear, no, it's not necessary. Now, there are certain religions and, and groups that gather even today, and in their worship, incense is a, a crucial component. And see, we cannot approach God with a physical incense burning, without a physical incense burning. So do we today still have to approach God with frankincense burning, just as the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, as they met in the tabernacle, frankincense was an essential part it was required for approaching God and to meet with him in that tabernacle, in that dwelling place where God met with his people. Why should I care? Well, I want to talk about this. What does God value? And rather than God saying that God values the specific natural material of frankincense, what he values is obedience to his word. That is how God commanded his people to meet with him, with the animal sacrifices, specific animals, with the incense, specific natural materials. And God values obedience to his word. I want to take a very quick, I believe, chronological walkthrough, if I can keep my verses straight here. But Leviticus 6, 14 to 22, we talked about that God required frankincense to be a part of the offerings and the incense that a sweet smelling aroma would go up to God. Well, I thought of 1 Chronicles 21. 1 Chronicles 21, many of you are familiar with the story. David was commanded to build an altar for the Lord. And he's told to go to the wheat field of Ornan in order to build this offering. And so Ornan, in his generosity, offers to give everything to David for free. Here's the field, here's the oxen, here's the wheat, all for the offering up to the Lord. But then David replies with this when he's offered to receive it for free. No, but I will surely buy it for the full price. For I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which cost me nothing. When I, when I read that, I was very convicted. Because I said, you know what? I was hesitating to spend $8 on a box of frankincense to share with you guys, right? And I'm looking for the best deal that I can because, oh, well, I, I, I want to... I want to show love and generosity, but 
not if it costs me too much, right? David said, no, I'm going to pay full price for this. I will not offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. So think, what is valuable to us? And do we offer that up to God and give to him what is valuable to him? Jeremiah 6.20, does God still require frankincense for us to approach him today? Well, we don't want to get so caught up in the physical act of burning that incense, right? Because what does Jeremiah 6.20 say? In a message from God to a rebellious and idolatrous nation who were rejecting the word of God, we read this. God's response, for what purpose to me comes frankincense from Sheba and sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet to me. They were coming with frankincense, though. Why weren't they accepted? Because what does the Lord value? Obedience to him and submission to his word and to his will. Not the burning of some natural substance, but obedience to his word and obedience to his will. What is valuable to God? Micah 6, verses 6 and 7. This sweet-smelling aroma, right? What is pleasing to God? And verses that I've often shared at the Lord's Supper because I can't help but think of the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ in reading Micah 6, 6 to 7. What does God value? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? When I read that, I praise God. I don't need to give my firstborn for my transgression because God gave his. And we praise God for the Lord Jesus Christ that we can approach him because God is pleased with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. God declared of his son who gave his life a ransom for many. And then Ephesians 5, 16, as I'm thinking about what does God value? What do we value? Well, I'm doing my very best to finish by noon because what do each and every one of us value? We value our time. Our time is valuable. Time is something that you can't get back. And if you waste it, it's a lost cause, right? You can't get that minute, that second, that hour, that that day back. Time is valuable. Even Ephesians 5, 16, that phrase, redeeming the time, buying back the time. Why? Because time is valuable. Time is, is costly. It's worth something. Am I willing to give to God my time, right? That's oftentimes the most valuable thing I have. My time, am I giving that to the Lord? And I believe God does value the time that we can and should offer up to him. So thinking of this costly gift, this treasure, as the word of God describes it, that the wise man brought frankincense, which was a sweet smelling aroma. I ask the question, do we still need to approach God by burning literal incense? No, we do not. But do we still need to approach God with a sweet smelling aroma? And I would say, yes, we do. And for that, we look at some portions of the New Testament. As we look at sweet smelling aromas, now, obviously the Old Testament written in Hebrew, the New Testament written in Greek, so not the exact same word, but the English translation of a sweet smelling aroma, just like frankincense produced that sweet smelling aroma, what sweet smelling aromas are produced in the New Testament? Well, first and foremost, we have to start with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you could turn there if you'd like, but I'll read to you Ephesians 5.2. Ephesians 5.2 says this, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. We still have to approach God through a sweet smelling aroma, but it's not frankincense. It's through the sacrifice and offering of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that each and every one of us here this morning can say, amen, praise the Lord, that we approach God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I love these pictures, and I was super thrilled as I read them. Leviticus 4 and Leviticus 16. Notice this about the tabernacle. We must begin with the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Well, we have this picture in Leviticus. Leviticus 4, 7. Blood from the sin offering was placed on the horns of the altar of incense. And then and only then, after that altar of incense was consecrated by the blood of the sacrifice, was that incense acceptable to God. Right. And in the same way, we can't just approach God on our own terms and say, well, I'm going to come down. I'm going to pray and I'm going to pray the way that I want. No. The blood of Jesus Christ, in a sense, consecrates our prayers and makes us acceptable. In a sense, Christ enables us to have our prayers accepted by God. 
I praise God for the picture of that blood from the sin offering placed on the horns of the altar of incense. And even more, Leviticus 16, 12, the fire used to light or used to burn the incense was always taken from the altar of burnt offering. Think about that. The fire used to ignite the altar of incense was always taken from, the source was that altar of burnt offering, right? And in the same way, the sacrifice of Christ ignites us so that our prayers are acceptable to God. We always must come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I love these pictures. And for sake of time, we won't turn to Hebrews 10, but we read this. We have boldness to enter the holiest. Again, a reference to the tabernacle, but boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil. That is his flesh. We have to start with the Lord Jesus Christ. But then where do we go from there? Right, and in our last few minutes, we'll look at a few other references to a sweet smelling aroma. I encourage you to turn to Philippians chapter four. And for sake of time, we won't read the entire passage, but this meeting the practical needs of the household of faith is also referenced as a sweet smelling aroma to God. And we see here Paul writing to the Philippians and he thanks them for their generosity. They're giving of, it would appear, material things, even a financial gift um, th that would be part of this gift that the Philippians gave to Paul. And in Philippians chapter four, if you turn there, we see that it was delivered by the hand of Epaphroditus. And let's just read together Philippians four and verse 18. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Isn't that an incredible thing that our love and generosity as shown to the household of faith, to brothers and sisters in Christ, can ascend up to God as a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, right? And I share from the receiving end again, and we are just so appreciative of your prayers for our daughter, for our family, and just the generosity that has shown to our family, been shown in the past three years. Like we have just been so blessed. And to imagine that I can be a blessing to someone else, but not only that, it's a sweet smelling aroma an acceptable sacrifice to God. I praise God for the chapel family here at Fifth Avenue Chapel, and I pray that you do as well. May we all be encouraged, not just during the season of Christmas, to be generous and loving, but let's be generous as God provides and God enables uh, generosity throughout the year as it ascends to God as a sweet smelling aroma. Our prayers. Um, we won't turn to Revelation 5, but Revelation 5, 8, Revelations 8, 3 through 4, specifically references golden bowls filled with incense which are the prayers of the saints. Again, that reminder that we saw in Psalm 141, incense throughout scripture is a picture of our prayers, right? As incense is burned and ascends up to heaven, our prayers ascend up to God. And God loves when we come to him through Jesus Christ in our prayer life. And I ask you, as I often have to challenge myself, how is my prayer life? Oftentimes it's lacking. Life is just nonstop. You get so busy. But we have this incredible access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ to go to him in prayer. Now, I'll suggest this. What are those prayers specifically that go up as incense? And, and maybe I'm being a little loose in my interpretation, but I believe any of our prayers that we come to God through Jesus Christ are pictured in this incense. Now, does God want all of our prayers to be God, I come to you because I need this, I need that, help me with this, give me this, give me that. Always needy, 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 help me. That shouldn't be our only prayer life. But is God pleased with those prayers? I believe that those types of prayers acknowledge our dependence on God, right? But also God loves to have us come to him and say, God, thank you so much for your son. Thank you for your daily provision for me. Thank you for being such a wonderful and good God. I share an example of, you know, my son, right? So thinking of us going and approaching our Heavenly Father, my son August, right? He's at that three-year-old stage where it's, hey, let me open that pouch for you. No, I do it. I do it. I do it. And so, okay, sure, try it. He tries it, can't get it. Daddy, can you help me? Right? And it's not this like pride where I'm like, oh, I told you so. Maybe there's a little bit of that, but, you know, forgive me for that. But it's this, this, wow, my son relies on me. He needs me. And God appreciates when we come to him and say, God, I need you. I can't do this on my own. But even greater, and even just yesterday at play practice, I was sitting in one of these pews and August was 
two rows behind, and all I hear is, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And I'm like, what does this kid want now? So I turn around, and he goes, Daddy, I love you. And I just said, like, like yeah, I love that, right? So how much more with our Heavenly Father if it's always, give me this, give me that, I need help with this, right? God loves us to acknowledge our dependence on him, but how much just like as earthly fathers to their earthly children, do we love to hear, Daddy, I love you, right? Do we have that same prayer life with our Heavenly Father? Does that type of prayer ever ascend from my lips up to God as incense, a sweet smelling aroma to God? Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your son. And then even beyond just our prayer life, ourselves, our entire lives to be offered up to God as a sweet smelling aroma. Now I might be stretching it here, but um, I want you to turn to second Corinthians chapter two. And why do I say that? Because that exact phrase, sweet smelling aroma is not necessarily found in here, but this idea of fragrance, we talked about the impact of incense, the power of perfume, the force of a fragrance, the ability of an aroma. And we see ourselves described as a fragrance. Second Corinthians chapter two, reading verses 15 and 16, to imagine that we, our lives, when we read in Romans 12, right, a living sacrifice, to imagine that we, in the way that we live, can be offered up as a fragrance to God. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ. Just take that in for a minute, right? We, living in this life, or a fragrance of Christ to God, but among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. To imagine that someone can look at my life and the way that I'm living, the, the way that I'm talking, and even the things I think about that are acted upon, right? People can look at my life. Am I being a fragrance for Christ unto God but among those who are being saved and among the lost, right? We can be a sweet fragrance and a testimony to brothers and sisters in the Lord, but also to those who are outside of Christ, right? We pray that even those that don't know Christ and are dead in their sin, that they would, they would smell that awful stench and foul odor of their sin and the deadness of that sin. But the beautiful, sweet smelling aroma, the fragrance in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. May our lives be that testimony even as we consider this gift of frankincense, may we be reminded the wise men brought that which was valuable. Are you and I bringing that which is valuable and most treasured in our own lives and offering it up to the Lord? Not just our prayer life, not just our material blessings, but every aspect of our lives, giving unto God as a sweet smelling aroma to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. When we can look into your word, and we think of this group of wise men, perhaps one of them carrying the simple gift of frankincense, yet it was considered a treasure, most valuable. And as he saw the child, as these wise men saw the savior, they bowed down and worshiped. May that be our response. And may we present that which is valuable to us, whether it be our time, our talents, our treasure. Lord, we pray that we would make it our aim to be well-pleasing to you, even in this Christmas season, Christmas season, but beyond that, may we offer to you that which we value, but that which you value. May we consider the gift of frankincense. May our prayers be a sweet smelling aroma to you. May we call upon you and say that we desperately need you, but may we also call upon you and say that we desperately love you. We thank you for the gift of salvation found in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would bless each and every individual here as we leave from this place and consider these things. We thank you again for your word, for your spirit, most of all that we can come to you because of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.